What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Today we're doing a deep dive on some super nerdy battery stuff. I'm really excited to have Sean Maida, a battery scientist, uh, join the program. Sean, welcome to HyperChange. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so you shot me an email um, a couple days ago about a breakthrough transition metal-free cathode um, and a new paper that was published by some researchers out of the University of Maryland, way out of my depth. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating and you have sort of convinced me that this could be a big deal or leaves us a lot of sort of moonshots in the battery materials world to think about. So as I'm doing my research about Tesla, we've been on this constant quest to figure out what goes into batteries, how to make them, how to scale that, how to do it efficiently and cheaply. Um, this is totally in line with all that. So really pumped to learn about this. So Sean, maybe you could tell us um, a, just like a two second about who you are and what your background is and then help us break down uh, this, this really interesting paper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've, I've been studying battery chemistry for, for six or seven years. I've worked in the industry for four years um, at a couple of companies that you mentioned here, uh, Nano One Materials in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Sela Nanotechnologies currently uh, in the Bay Area. Um, I'm super pumped about battery chemistry. Um, I love what's happening in the industry. I love your channel and thought it'd be cool to talk about it. Definitely. And so this paper that you've sent me, um, it actually had a Jeff Don quote. That's why it piqued my interest. Everybody's favorite Jeff Don, uh, Tesla researcher, where he was saying something about how this had one of the most, I guess, creative or innovative battery chemistry solutions. So maybe you could break down sort of at a high level, like what caught your eye about this new paper that came out? What was so exciting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's actually not super new. It did come out about a year ago. Um, the thing that, you know, it, it came out of University of Maryland and, and Jeff Don really commented on it. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other people in the industry had a similar feeling about it. Um, and the reason why this is really interesting is because it's actually a transition metal free cathode. Um, and sort of, as you know, and your viewers know, um, you know, the, the cathode is, is a very significant component of, of the cost of, of cells, there are a lot of issues as associated with transition metals like cobalt, um, potentially nickel in the future. Um, and so having a transition metal free cathode is really exciting for that reason. You know, um, when we're looking at scaling these technologies, um, while this is just a single academic paper, you know, the, the fundamental science has to be there. Uh, the supply chain has to be there, you know, um, and being able to make a high energy density cell without transition metals um, and there's a lot of other cool details. I'd be happy to talk about that paper um, is in my mind a huge deal. Um, and I, I, I think like you have a healthy skepticism about most battery breakthroughs. So, you know, it's good to be cautious. It's good to really understand the details here. Um, but just that fact alone, no transition metals from the cathode is very exciting. Um, yeah, and I want to dig into that a little bit because, you know, we always hear about the next battery breakthrough. I'm sure you are too. Um, what particularly made you so fascinated about this, you know, given it is in a lab, it is years away from commercialization, but, you know, you read tons of papers. Why was this something that you were like, whoa? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, I could just take a step back and, and you know, the way a traditional um, lithium ion cell works, you know, all the ones that have been commercialized today, you have an intercalation cathode with transition metals. That's a big cost component. Um, and you move lithium between that and, and typically a graphite anode. Um, and the way that this is different actually is, is you know, just no transition metals. Instead of, um, you know, moving lithium back and forth, which you are doing as well, of course, it's a lithium ion cell, um, but the redox chemistry going on in the cathode is actually a, a halogen intercalation mechanism. So you're putting chlorine, you're putting bromine in between these sheets of graphite, uh, much in a similar way that you would put lithium into sheets of graphite in an anode. Um, you know, it's, it's quite stunning that it has a high potential of four volts versus, um, versus lithium. And, and what that means is, you know, the, it, it's comparable, if not better than sort of state of the art in terms of uh, theoretical energy density. And, and theoretical energy density is really the, you know, the, the crystal structure, how much lithium can you put in per, per unit mass per, specifically? Yeah, and I, it seems like we've already gotten to the point where these batteries are high quality enough and energy efficient enough to like solve a lot of the use cases, but it's about how we reduce the impact of building a lot of them um, and really scaling with those supply chains. And so that's where it seems like the innovation is here is like we can use these, you know, way more ubiquitous metals and materials that are way easier and cheaper to work with to actually build these same quality batteries. 
Is that kind of the gist of this breakthrough? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the, I think the breakthrough is that they're not using metals. Um, you know, of course, there's metals in the cell components and all of that, but the cathode itself, um, there's no transition metals. You know, there's just lithium chloride, lithium bromide, graphite. Um, that's what makes it super cool. Wow. And so when you read about a sort of like technology like this, like what's the path to commercializing this? What are the next steps? Like you said, this paper came out a year ago. So when something like this happens in academia that everyone's excited about, how does this start to trickle down into, you know, the consumer world of like the companies you work with, of Tesla, you know, how does this go from the lab to the product or like at least just give us a high level of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this is has only been demonstrated at least publicly in a research setting. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you're going to expect a lot of uh, products, you know, in the next year or two or, or anything like that. This is a longer term uh, research project. But in terms of how these these technologies get commercialized, you know, you ask an interesting question and, and there's there's a lot of ways in which it can do that. Um, I would say sort of in terms of, of commercialization, uh, there needs to be um, you know, a lot of work done. There needs to be pilot lines, there needs to be manufacturing, there needs to be quality control and a lot of these other things, which which have not been currently demonstrated. Um, but once you have an idea, you know, a, a lab-based solution, let's say, uh, typically these researchers will partner with the industry, partner, um, industry partners, um, you know, a, Similar to you, I found it really interesting that Jeff Don had had this this take on it. Um, he's very well connected to Tesla. Um, I think they are, um, you know, have no idea whether they are working on this or not. But um, I'd be surprised if they hadn't looked at it. Um, yeah, and so when Jeff, let's dive into that. When he says, "I found the quote here." Um, the paper by the University of Maryland and the Army team is the most creative new battery chemistry I've seen in at least ten years. So you know, what makes this so creative and different? Is it that it's not using any of these rare metals that everyone else is using? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things about it that are creative. I would say that's sort of the biggest, um, biggest shift from current lithium ion technologies. Every cathode has transition metals um, that, that's in a commercial product. You know, Tesla uses, you know, start off with LCO, now NCA and maybe NMC combinations thereof. Um, those are the those are the high energy density chemistries. That's what everybody is looking for long range EVs. There are there are other examples, you know, for, for other use cases, but the common common thread here is that they all use transition metals. And so one other thing that he says here is the fact that Li, I guess lithium chloride and lithium bromide reversibly convert and form halogen intercalated graphite is truly incredible. So what does that mean? And could you walk us through like some of the I guess more like what I'm curious of is more granular implications like you know, what does this mean they can build the battery with? Like, are we replacing all the nickel? Are we replacing all the cobalt? Um, is this a better performing battery or like just cheaper to produce? Yeah, so um, I would say pretty much all of those things, um, definitely to some extent. So um, it's it's very interesting because I have not seen any chemistry and, and you know, based on Jeff Don's comments, I would, I would you know, predict that he's, of a similar view that there there hasn't been an example of of a new intercalation chemistry like this that provides high energy density um, and good you know coulombic efficiency um, you know it it really does seem to be at least at the lab scale the most creative battery you know chemistry that that that's been reported in who knows how long um, it's, it's difficult to predict how these things will develop but I would expect that. Um, industry is is forming connections with with you know this group at University of Maryland. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of interest. I have personal interest from from the chemistry standpoint. I, th I think it's a really cool idea um, that you can stick chlorine and bromine atoms and graphite and make it a cathode. Um, it's somewhat of a hybrid of of a number of of different uh, chemistries that that do exist in, in you know in, in different fields and and as well as sort of in um, electric transport, you know, there, there's that intercalation aspect of it, which, which leads typically to highly stable, long lasting chemistries. Um, you know, if you look at LFP or NMC or NCA, these are all intercalation chemistries. 
Um, graphite is also an intercalation chemistry. Um, and so while we're sort of reaching the, the theoretical limits, um, at least at the material level of, of, of these, um, these cathode and anode materials, um, this sort of provides a platform at least to study a lot of different things um, that can kind of push the energy density higher um, and, and you know, hopefully do a lot of great things in the world. Yeah, and one of the big problems I've been thinking about on, a lot on hyperchange is how do we increase the supply of these really efficient batteries and really scale up to meet the demand that's coming. Um, that's what Tesla's, you know, we're all speculating about their battery investor day, how they do that. So, you know, and I recently had the CEO of Novonics on talking about, you know, this new synthetic graphite versus like natural graphite and this whole idea of like creating your own supply chain locally to go have what goes into batteries to manage costs, you know, geopolitically has all these benefits. like. I'm curious if you think we need this sort of innovation in the materials side of battery production to really meet, you know, scaling from half a million or a million EVs a year to 90 million plus electric boats and planes and trains and whatever, you know, is, is this going to require these sort of innovative papers to really scale up effectively? That's a great question. Um, and it definitely won't hurt. Um, that is for sure. As to whether, you know, if you look at sort of the raw materials that go into the cells, there's a lot of them on Earth, like just on the planet. So, you know, if you if you go and calculate how many, um, you know, cars, you know, how much cobalt is in a Tesla and, and then, you know, if there's two billion cars, for example, uh, in the world, um, those numbers work out. Um, I can't really speak to how quickly or um, you know, whether those resources are extractable at, at sort of cost. Um, my, my impression of it is that no, you know, there, there needs to be sort of, um, at the same time we scale the mining, the, you know, the, the raw materials, the processing, uh, we also need to, to be exploring new chemistries. Um, and that's why this is also very exciting because, you know, if you look at the elements that are present, you know, there's no way you can ever remove lithium from a lithium ion battery. Um, if you had asked me a few years ago, if you can remove transition metals, I probably would have said no also. Um, wow. And then, so now this is chain opening up that whole door. That's sort of the big idea of this paper is like, wait, maybe we don't have to use transition metals and maybe it won't be this method, but now there's sort of like a big focus and innovation there in, in this batteries. It sounds like this whole battery materials world has really evolved in the past decade of like a lot of innovation is happening and like just, I can for, sort of feel it picking up and like there's a ton of capital flowing into this space. I mean, your company, Silent Nanotechnology, is like founded by ex-Tesla people, raised a ton of money to do all of this R&D. And there's, you know, dozens of companies researching these sort of it's seemingly next generation materials. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, I just want to go back to something you mentioned just previously, you know, totally. we were discussing about the you know supply chain. Can we meet this demand for, for battery cells, you know? and and, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Tesla using LFP in China and, and sort of that seems like a, you know, very, very reasonable, rational, cost effective choice for that use case. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, the, you know, I would argue and I, I think others have argued that uh, moving to LFP um, is due to supply and, and, and constraints of, of, of that um, you know, those materials, the nickel, the cobalt, um, LFP is, is great in the sense that it has iron and phosphate and you can dig those out of the ground and there's a lot of it everywhere. Um, so I think the industry is somewhat shifting in that direction to use chemistries that are sort of using less precious metals like iron, for example. Um, and, and we're seeing that sort of, um, in a lot of places, but at the same time, you know, um, that hit in energy density is 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 also a downside, right? So, so these manufacturers are going to have to balance what they need for a specific use case and and what the supply can can provide for them. And so, while that is sort of playing out in the industry, um, you know, I'm I'm always kind of keeping an eye out for for things like this paper because, um, you know, if we kind of push push the boundaries on that front as well. Um, we can also like we want to diversify into as many materials uh, that can be used as possible and better if they're cheap and better if they don't contain transition metals, especially expensive transition metals. So 
Um, I think all of these things are happening at once. And so it's very difficult to say kind of what's necessary, right? It, it's, you know, I make it a policy to try and not predict the future. Um, but, um, you know, all of these things are going to happen, you know, and, and sort of if, if we get, um, you know, electric transport scaling to, to the, you know, scaling to what we, I would say, you know, we want it to, and, and that is really removing any kind of, uh, combustion engine vehicles, um, then all of these things are going to happen. We're going to need new, new cell chemistries, um, diversified cell chemistries, um, and also uh, higher, higher energy density cell chemistries. One thing I'm curious about is uh, a lot of speculation around Tesla's acquisition of Maxwell Technologies and this idea of the dry battery electrode and that being a potential breakthrough from a cost manufacturing and efficiency standpoint. Um, in kind of a game-changing way, it's especially exciting because it appears to be so close to commercialization. So have you looked into the papers um, behind the DBE technology and do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I would say I haven't looked in, in super great detail, but I think that's interesting for a lot of reasons. I would say most people outside of the industry aren't familiar with how these, um, you know, these slurries, these inks, these are, are coded onto the electrodes, how that process works. Um, but something that is done is essentially you um this might be too much detail but you know you 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 take your your battery material it's a powder right um and that powder needs to be mixed with with certain additives binders um and you need a solvent to do that um solvent that's common you know it depends on whether you're mixing it for the cathode or the anode different solvents are used uh different binders are used but um, in particular you know the cathode is often using um, a solvent called NMP. It's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's actually a teratogen, um, but it has all the right properties that you need to, you know, dissolve the binders and get everything mixed well and have it dry even, you know, these- And these... you're getting at the point that this, the solvent is toxic. That's Correct. right. And that's what part of the reason is, and then you need to dispose of it and deal with it. And that adds a lot of complexity and, and sort of friction. Yeah, you need, you need, you know, drying ovens for that. Um, you need to be able to capture the solvent. You need to, you know, engineering controls. Um, all of these are, are you know, I, I don't know the specific regulations on how these plants work, but um, all of these need to be done. And all of that is capital cost. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially it can be recycled. But, you know, this is, um, I would say, you know, one weak point in how you manufacture lithium ion cells. Um, and so for that reason, a dry battery electrode, um, is, is very interesting. I don't quite understand how it works specifically. I'm, I'm almost imagining kind of, you know, mixing the cathode materials with, with a, a binder, potentially even the same binder that you would use in, in sort of a, a standard, um, a cell line and, um, you know, almost like maybe it's like a heat gun kind of approach, like you're, you're, you're blasting hot particles onto a foil and you know that's i would say don't 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 quote me on that but that's um kind of how i i almost imagine that could work potentially um but why it's interesting you know and and, and the results of it are actually you know the, the the cool thing about it right the details of that are are not super important um there's you can increase what's called the tortuosity of the electrode, basically means that, you know, there, there are more paths for lithium to travel. Um, you can also increase the loading. Um, so how thick the material is on the electrode. Um, and this is all claimed publicly by Maxwell uh, and Tesla. So, you know, this is um, um, all out there. Totally. Perfectly. That's what I love about this is Maxwell was a public company and they were trying to hype up to their investors the promise of this dry battery electrode technology and this big OEM they were working with. So while doing that, they touted all of its promises and sort of showed us all the potential of the technology because they were trying to shout from the rooftops to get value from it. So I think it's, I kind of love the way that worked out because if they were a private company, we may have never got to know any of these little clues. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, it seems as though this is, you know, this is maybe not like a chemistry breakthrough. This is an engineering breakthrough, right? A um, manufacturing breakthrough, exactly. um, which is sound is very like from my talking to investors in Maxwell, it sounds like the real big power of this was like chemistry agnostic and that 
that it was really a manufacturing method and you know maybe this transition free metal cathode when it comes out eventually could be rolled up into this or i don't know i feel like i'm getting way out way out of my depth there but um. yeah you know the, the transition metal free cathode is super interesting because you know you can use uh from my understanding you know you can use a synthetic graphite um you know we know that sort of synthetic graphites are being produced as, as an alternative for for mined graphite you know Part of that is supply chain constraints and, and issues with that being uh, localized in China, a lot of it. Um, Although uh, Chris Burns, who was on the show from Novonics, was saying that there was also performance benefits to the synthetic graphite, it sounds like, or even Jeff Don was touting, they're like, we don't know why, but it seems to be working better. So, which is a really good thing to have happen because I just thought right, that yeah. idea of like, you guys can actually build a factory and just start pumping out graphite instead of us mining it. I was like, wow, I didn't know that was an option, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, Graphite synthesis is is very energy intensive. You know, you need to get ovens, at least a standard way. I don't know how Novonics is doing it, or maybe there are other ways. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to make all of these things. Um, but you know, you you take um, you know carbon precursors and uh, you essentially center it uh, at quite high temperature. Um, and so. I think historically that would be why graphite was mined mostly for for cathode materials because you can just dig it right out of the ground right and then you got to you know get those particles you got to do all the same things you got to make them into spheres um but you know not having to do a high temperature uh centering step um was probably why at least uh historically uh, a lot of natural graphite has been used but you know i think that's it brings up sort of another um, another issue potentially with natural graphites, um, and one mine is not going to be the same as the next, right? Um, you know, the, these rather than a high temperature sintering step, these are formed by high pressure over thousands of years um, in the Earth's crust, and and you know who knows what chemical process. Yeah, you need like a from. natural phenomena to occur perfectly versus like something in the lab that we design. It's like well, one should create a much more consistent out you know, output. I would 100% agree. Yeah. Um... Interesting. So when you think about Tesla, you know, battery investor day, I guess your sweet spot would be like materials sort of side and that cathode and anode, like, you know, what are you, what kind of gets you pumped as a battery nerd for Tesla investor day and what they could like push the envelope on, or if you, if you have any like ideas on that? I think really I'm, I'm, you know, most interested in sort of seeing the roadmap for the dry battery electrode technology. Um, you know, whether they're exploring new chemistries, uh, you know, such as this uh, halogen intercalation chemistry, um, you know, my sense of it is that is, you know, even if they were, which I think is likely that they and many others are, um, are looking at this, uh, it might be too soon to really mention anything about that. Um, but you know, I, this is all speculation, of course. Um, I think I'm also interested in sort of, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with sort of the other aspects of things like, you know, how, how their business model will work, you know, autonomy, if that's going to be out. Um, don't know much about how, how all that works, but, you know, I'm personally, it's, it's just very exciting for me to sit on the sidelines and, and, you know, hear and watch what's going on. Um, I also am very curious as to whether, uh, you know, Tesla will be kind of, you know, building their own cell lines. Um, you know, if, if, if Panasonic um, is going to be sort of scaling further with them or, or if they are kind of potentially diverging in terms of, of you know, who's going to be building the factories. Um, to be honest, there's just so much that's going on. Uh, it's difficult to keep track of, you know, I, I, I would say fundamentally, I find the you know the chemistry the most interesting, um, but all of these surrounding things are are so important. Um, and and you know I'm I'm going to be probably right there, uh, along with a lot of other people like you watching it uh, eagerly. Yeah, so many facets to the innovation that Tesla is getting ready to display um, gets me super pumped. And so you know I wonder what you think about Tesla becoming a battery cell producer if that indeed happens. I mean someone coming from the battery world like how big of a deal is that because panasonic you know lg all these companies that specialize in batteries for decades and all of a sudden we have tesla saying they could do it better vertically integrate like if they are building their own production line like in, in theory you know how big of a deal is that 
um because it just seems like that is kind of a tectonic shift in the real deep battery supply chain i would be very surprised if tesla has not learned a hell of a lot from working with panasonic all these years yeah. um you know panasonic was was by far the industry leader especially in in cylindrical cells uh, arguably still is um maybe not you know that that's sort of um up in the air i think at this point but um you know I think they probably want to have more control. You know, right now the Gigafactory is separated. The the, the um, uh, Nevada Gigafactory is separated into a tes Tesla side and a Panasonic side, right? Yep. And um, um, I mean, it's a cool facility, it, absolutely. You know, but they very much so are working independently. You know, they will make all the cells, um, and then once they get the cells, um, they cross the line over to the other side to to build the module. I've right? been there. It's like a autonomous like cart with all these battery cells and they literally drop off like the finished product and then Tesla takes it over. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Um, I had had a opportunity to do a tour. I was I was very impressed. You mentioned something about Panasonic being really good at cylindrical cells. We haven't really seen another company. I guess maybe Rivian is going to do cylindrical cells, but how come everyone else is doing pouch cells and Tesla's doing cylindrical and how much does that form factor pouch prismatic cylindrical actually really matter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, so if we want to contrast uh, cylindrical cells with pouch cells specifically, you know, um, I think the history is really important here. So Panasonic was, these were laptop battery cells initially. Um, and so they made those, um, I guess the form factor in particular is, is, is very relevant to the, the end product that it's going to go into. Um, I would say the benefit of cylindrical cells, um, essentially you wind, wind the electrodes around in a cylinder and then you have a steel can. Um, and that has, I think, better opportunity for heat management compared to pouch cells. Um, although there are, there are ways to tackle these strategies as well. Um, pouch cells, you know, you may be able to stack more of them. So basically put more battery materials per unit volume than you would a cylindrical cell. Um, but there are other challenges, which, um, you know, I don't want to say too much. I, I think I, I would, wouldn't be confident in an answer, but I don't know that there are enough is enough data out there currently with pouch cells in a EV application, for example, to demonstrate that you know you can also you know get sort of the the energy density, the cooling, the cycle life, all of these things, uh, you know, for for you know however many thousands of cycles or, or years in a car. So. Um, I'm a little agnostic as to what kind of is going to be um, sort of a dominant uh, format in the future. Um, I know that cylindrical cells work. Um, I, I can definitely see that trajectory increasing. Um, I don't. I don't imagine um, that Tesla has plans to move into pouch cells for, for their cars. That would be a bit of a surprise to me. Um, but you know there are a lot of other kind of factors too. Like um, I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface um, on on this. But you know, for example, gassing in the cell. Um, cylindrical cells can actually have a, a sort of a pressure release valve that is, um, I would say, more easily opened if there is gassing in the cells uh, compared to a larger format pouch cell. Um, yeah, it's it's really tough. It, it's sort of an engineering game, um, you know. Uh, that that's what I would say about it. Yeah, one thing that I'm I really appreciate a lot is how much you know, not just of the cell chemistry, but real engineering goes into the whole pack. And that's what I, I'm kind of uh, one of my moonshots is like they don't need the modules anymore. So this whole concept of four thousand cells might be antiquated. Or like, what is Elon Musk and Tesla going to do with a blank whiteboard of you know, all the decade of experience and decide like what type of cell, how many of them, like, I'm just so, so curious. And I know they're going to remove the modules. And then that starts to like, we're back to the drawing or whiteboard moment. So I think it's, it, it could be just wild the way they've re-engineered and just showed the next generation of technology. Um, so I don't know, I'm curious, like, do you have any predictions of like, is it going to be like 4,000 cells or is it going to be like 144 cells or like, 
Do you have any theories of how that could change? Um, yeah, good question. You know, um, I think you just to start off, I think you brought up a great point about Tesla and sort of how they are, you know, I would say if any company is, is, has, has not fallen victim to the sunk cost fallacy, it's Tesla, you know, they're always willing to reassess their assumptions, you know, maybe in the past five years, uh, the chemistry has changed the, the, the energy density of, of, of the raw materials, uh, the cathode and anode materials has changed that they could rethink um, their cell format, but you know, there would have to be a very good reason. Uh, I don't know what that reason is. Um, you know, it, it may be that, um, you know, like you said, changing the mod to no module, for example, having a single module or, or just a single pack with, um, that's news to me, but there may be implications towards um, better heat exchange um, in the pack and better heat and temperature control. Um, as well as energy density, right? Like the module itself um, has to serve to kind of like keep cells in, you know, a given number of cells in series and parallel to give the voltage and, and current requirements you need for a Tesla, which obviously are quite demanding. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how, they're, how they're thinking about, or if they are rethinking about rethinking how cells are made, but they have so much infrastructure uh, currently for, for cylindrical cells, um, there would have, in my mind, there would have to be a very significant benefit to, to sort of dial that back, um, or shift, but certainly they could, they could be working on it in parallel, um, as sort of a, a smaller project. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's happening, but, but a shift away from cylindrical cells, um, I don't know. I'm not aware of, of, of anything that that would indicate that currently, um, but then again, you know these things move very quickly, and and I've been fooled before. So, um, you know, it's it's an interesting thought you had. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time, Sean. Really appreciate the the chat and uh, you reaching out and and you know taking the time to tell us a little about this paper. So so interesting. Um, that this I didn't I had no idea that innovation research was occurring uh, to try and make this transition metal free um, cathode. But I guess maybe could you end it by telling us like once again, like why this is so important and like caught your interest and like how we can sort of be following updates and be looking out for new versions of this technology? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the key point is, uh, you know, I, I like to be a little bit cautious about things like this. So, so I don't want people to think this is some crazy breakthrough that's going to, you know, change the world overnight. But um, you know, that to me is, is very exciting. Just the fact that you don't need these transition metals, um, you know, potentially, um, and cause that uh, has huge implications to reinventing the whole EV supply chain. That's really like kind of the crux of if this works, like a lot of the calculations about we have to ship the lithium here and do this and do that. And it's all these fossil fuels and all this pollution and all this time and cost and complexity, like that has the opportunity to all change and all be disrupted if this research can continue to be commercialized. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it sort of de-risks the local, the, or rather the location of where these metals are on the earth, right? Uh, wow. they're, they're, they're not evenly distributed, uh, very, very far from it, actually. Um, if you can use a, you know, a purely synthetic uh, process for, for um, you know, making a transition metal free battery, um, that is really what, what gets me excited. Um, and I hope it gets, you know, your, your listeners and your, your watchers excited too, and hope to kind of continue the discussion. You know, it's so fast moving and, and, uh, just want to thank you for having me on. Yeah. Well, thanks again so much, Sean. I learned so, so much. I'm going to have to like rewatch this and, and uh, rethink about it. But I love that concept of like, there's a, we don't need to get everything out of the ground. There's a way to make it synthetically and how we do this. There's wild innovation and opportunity there. So really exciting space to follow. It may take 10 years to play out, but we'll be following. <laughs> so thanks again. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Peace out. Thank you.